Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Professor Bofford, for the introduction. Very unusual. Being from South Africa is usually so cold and, you know, limited with words, but it was very verbal today. <laughs> so it's an incredible honor to be here today and to stand as president of uh, this association. It's a fabulous meeting, and to give you an idea, we have almost 2,000 participants from 93 countries in the world. Now, this is the 10th anniversary for me. I became a member of the society in 2007 when Michael Sarr, yeah, bigger than life, and uh, uh, Professor Harder, uh, he was the president, and Felix Harder actually was uh, the secretary. And I've been very lucky because uh, I had the pleasure of working in, in the executive committee with some giants of surgery. First of all, Professor Kitajima, he's honoring us with his presence today. Michael Sarr, Ken Bofford. Ken was actually president between uh, 2009 and 2011, a very difficult time. And then Professor Ackerstrom, uh, and uh, finally, in Bangkok, uh, Nopadol uh, or uh, Urai. But there are other people uh, that uh, we need to recognize. And of course, the first one is Victor Berci. Yesterday, uh, we recognized his dedication to the International Society of Surgery, 38 years. In a way, Victor is the ISS itself. I mean, presidents come and go every two years. Victor has been there forever. I want to thank him today for his wisdom, for his advice, and for his friendship. But then the meeting could not happen without uh, Chris Torz, uh, who has the unfortunate role of putting together the program every two years, quite painful, thank you to the fact that no one respects the deadlines, but he does it. And then recently has been joined by Mike Eliopoulos, he's young, uh, and he brings enthusiasm in the media. You guys can follow what he does on Facebook, which is amazing. And of course, the local organizing committee, Professor Pierre Calvien and Nicolas de Martins, they had the role of leading a local organizing committee that had only 18 months to put together this course, this congress, and I think they've done a fabulous job. And then a special thank goes to Felix Arder. As I mentioned before, Professor Arder was the secretary of the society, and then Jean-Claude Givel became the secretary. Unfortunately, Jean-Claude died in the, during the opening ceremony of the Congress in Bangkok, and he left a huge empty hall. Jean-Claude was a scholar, he was a gentleman, he was incredibly dedicated to the society. So he's highly missed by all of us. Felix helped us in the transition, and then we were lucky because Ken Bofford agreed to play the role of secretary, bringing his experience as former president. Many other people have passed between 2015 and 2017, but I'm positive that all of you will notice that Jake Rosfeld is not here with us today. So I will ask for you to stand and observe 15 seconds to remember these giants of surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's move now to the talk. I remember a few months ago, Chris Torza said, well, do you, do you have a talk in mind? What's the title of your talk? And it was really a moment of reflection. I've been present to many presidential talks, uh, and you always see a personal touch. Uh, it, it's a moment uh, uh, of reflection. And for me, it was a moment of reflection on this long journey. As Ken Bofer was saying, I moved to the United States to do one year of research, and 34 years later, I'm uh, still here. The title is not uh, mine. Title comes from uh, something that happened in the past. So I was a junior attending at UCSF, and uh, one day I operated an early gentleman who had gastric cancer. Now, much to my surprise, when we operated on him, uh, he had uh, carcinomatosis, uh, something that had not been detected by any preoperative uh, study was like half a millimeter type of implants. So I, I did the gastrectomy, but it was very tough. You know, you go back at night, uh, you have established a relationship, and I sat at the bedside of this gentleman, and much to my surprise, he was supporting me. I mean, I was a junior attending, so not very experienced in communicating this news. And when I asked him why 
he was so serene, he said, listen, I never thought I was going to live so long. So he told me a story and the story of his family. When uh, he was a child, he had been deported from the Warsaw ghetto to Auschwitz. All his family had died and he had survived. And he told me that what kept him alive were the dreams of what he could have done if he had survived. And eventually survived and uh, moved to the United States, became a famous writer, and he wrote a book, Memories of the Future, to remember his own experience, to remind people of that very dark period in the history. So sometimes when we interview residents, at least in the United States, people are strange. We say, if you, want to, if you could sit in a bench in front of a lake, who do you, would you like to have next to you, and what would you like to ask? So, you know, I'm not talking about Coker or Rolstead. I thought, remembering the experience that I had before about memories of the future, to remember my own dreams and see what has happened in this journey. So I come as uh, stressed by Dr. Bofford from a small and peaceful island in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. It's called Sicily. And the characteristic of the island is that uh, you're usually born there, you live there, you die there. You don't move. It's very unusual. And, uh, when I grew up, uh, my dreams were very limited at the beginning. Uh, my main focus was in sport. I was not really a good student. And uh, I was just uh, thinking, you know, I will uh, work hard and go to law school, follow the easy path, because my father and my brothers were all in uh, to law school. And then something happened. Few people in the audience will remember, but one day, during the Grand Prix of Monaco, a pilot from Ferrari died in an accident, Lorenzo Bandini. And so when uh, he died, one of the main uh, uh, newspapers in Italy published part uh, of an interview with this pilot, and I will translate from the Italian. To give a meaning to life uh, can lead to insanity, but a life without meaning is the torture of the restless, the unfulfilled desire. It's like a boat that wants to be on the sea, but is afraid of the sea. So I decided that I, it was a key moment. I decided to do something not only for me, but for other people. And so next thing I know is I enroll in medical school. I spent most of the clinical rotation in this old hospital. Uh, probably Professor Montori will remember, but it was the Vittorio Emanuele built at the time of the Second World War, 2,500 beds, gigantic. But during medical school, uh, there was uh, a key experience. I was accepted as an exchange student and I spent the summer at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Harvard. And there are some things that uh, I will never forget. One, I was impressed by the education, by the educational system. Third and fourth year medical students were really prepared to become interns and take care of patients. But then uh, I spend time with a unique person. Uh, some of you will remember Hermes Grillo, the father of tracheal surgery in the world. And uh, two things about Grillo. One was uh, his dedication to teaching. I remember one day during a tracheal reconstruction, he apologized to the fellow because he said, you know, maybe it's easier for me to put a stitch from this side of the table. In Italy, it doesn't happen. And the second is uh, he told me the story of his life. Uh, confirming that the United States are a country of opportunity. His father was a pure, poor shoemaker that worked in a small village in Sicily on this coast and then moved to the United States. Ironically, Grillo always dreamt about retiring in Italy. He did, but he died in a car accident in Tuscany in 2006. Now, I was impressed by this person. I was impressed by the educational system. I did not think I could do it. So at the same time, it, it was close to my graduation, and graduation is a special time. It's an ending, it's a beginning, it's the war memories of the year you spend in medical school and the dreams for the future. And at the time when I finished medical school, this is the way I dreamt about my future. I dreamt it was very straightforward. I was in a well-lightened tunnel. All I had to do was to follow the other people. I could see the light at the end of the tunnel and eventually was gonna become a good surgeon and take care of patients. So I started residence in general surgery. This is my first day, I was terrified. It was my first day on call and I said, oh my God, if they call me. 
But I start with a lot of enthusiasm. But unfortunately, it took a couple of years to realize that the beautiful tunnel I had in mind was very different. It was dark, no one was there, no one was taken by the end to teach me anything, and the light was barely visible at the end of the tunnel. So I realized that this is what had happened. If you look at the United States in 1890, William Olsen made a major change. Up to that moment, the center of attention following the European model was the professor. Also realized that the surgeons of the future were the residents, so he created the residency program. Now, this is in 1890 in the United States. Well, 100 years later, this transition had not happened in Italy. The professor was still at the center, and faculty, students, residents, and nurses just to make sure that the professor looks good. It's very sad to say that in many places in Italy, this is still the way education is established. So I, was, uh, I felt that I'd been betrayed in my dreams, and so I decided to talk to the chairman of the department. I thought he was going to be easy because he was a fabulous surgeon. He had trained in New York. He had spent the first five years after training in New York. But when I talked to him, he said, Marco, I understand your point, but this is Sicily. Things are not going to change. So he helped me getting a scholarship. But going back to the place where I was born, there is something unique. And this was described by one of our best writers, Leonardo Shash. When he described Sicily, he said, savage, which is true, artful, and eternally beautiful, Sicily provokes the perverse notion that every man is an island and pride is the supreme passion. In that moment, I decided I was going to move away and I was trying to be successful wherever I went. So it took a lot. And I remember talking to my family, talking to my friends, but I decided to leave. And with a very small scholarship, I flew from Sicily to California. Specifically, I had a one-year scholarship at the University of California, San Francisco. And it was a year of research in motility of the gastrointestinal tract. These were the mentors at the time, Lawrence Way and Carlos Pellegrini, who eventually were going to be mentors for the rest of my career. But during the first year, I realized that the educational system was fantastic. So I studied to have my degree recognized, and then I applied. I was lucky, and I was accepted at the University of California, San Francisco. Five clinical years. Now, we used to work a lot. We were on call every other night, 120 hours, but it was a fabulous experience. We worked in five hospitals. We were exposed to more than 100 professors, and I realized by the end of those five years that I'd done about major, 800 major operations, something that in Italy probably would have done by the time I died. But also, I spent two additional years in the Swallowing Center, and that's where my love for uh, the esophageal physiology came. So, now let's stop for a moment. If you look at this slide, it summarizes the cultural clusters in the world. There are 10. So I was moving from Latin Europe, which is Spain, France, and Italy, from the most southern part to the Anglo system. And I'll tell you, there are many differences, but there is one thing that shocked me. I moved from a wonderful Mediterranean diet to this type of diet. <laughs> now, you can imagine what happened if you are exposed to the diet during residency. You, I left Italy when I was in great shape, and this is the way I was <laughs> 10 years later. And they, I've been unable to shed those 50 pounds, even though Dr. Kibi pushes me. But things in the United States are planned. So I remember Halle de Bass was the chair. He sent me to Hong Kong. He said, you must work with Professor John Wong, a master of surgery. So I spent time with him working just on patients with esophageal cancer at the Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong. It was a fabulous experience. And then I moved to the University of California, San Francisco. Carlos Pellegrini had moved to Seattle. And I became the junior partner of somebody called Lawrence Way, clearly the best surgeons I've ever seen in my life. In 2008, I moved to the University of Chicago. Uh, it was a center that had a fabulous tradition uh, for esophageal surgery. But this was a key moment. It was very hard to cut the umbilical cord with my mentor, Lawrence Way. I was by myself, and from a mentee, 
I had to assume the role of mentor for so many young people. So it was a, it was a moment of growth. And for reasons that in part Professor Bolford explained, in 2016 I moved to the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So over 33 years I went around the United States. I was on the West Coast and then Chicago and now I'm back on the East Coast. So let me reflect for a moment on this journey. Many people probably will say, listen, you've been very lucky, you can consider this success. I agree in part by what you're doing, you are focusing on the tip of the iceberg. All of you in the audience, because it's not easy to become a surgeon, know that most of the iceberg is actually under the surface. The long nights, the struggles, and in my, in my personal case, the doubts. Many times, especially during the first year of residence, I didn't think I was going to make it. So if you want to read about the factors that play a role in success, I think this book uh, summarizes them very well. It's uh, Outliers, the Story of Success by Malcolm Gladwell. And there is no question that family values, uh, people uh, play a role. But at the end of the day, what makes a difference is passion. You must like what you do. And if you like it, you're willing to, work, to work very hard and eventually obtain success. Great book, but I think Gladwell forgot one thing, mentoring. Personally, I don't think that uh, you, cannot do, you can do it without a mentor. And as a matter of fact, if you ask successful academic physicians about the factors that have played a role, they will always quote mentorship as uh, the key element of their success. Now, during my career, I've been exposed, as I was mentioned during the career advancement course, to different type of mentors. There is the parent, that is, you know, the father figure that you love and you trust. There is the godfather. Uh, it's very, it's a dyadic relationship, but it's very, it's very powerful. It's great at the beginning of your career. It can be difficult to separate yourself later on. There is the big brother, big sister, nice, same level of training, but sometimes they don't have uh, the solutions, they have the same problem that you have. And then if you're lucky, sometimes there is somebody from far away, which in my case was John Wong, that looks after your career to make sure that you succeed without asking anything in exchange. Mentorship today, however, is more difficult than in the past. Uh, our residents are working 80 hours, uh, uh, especially after 2007, uh, there are financial pressures. And then there's, there is this very elusive concept of work-life balance uh, uh, that is the aspiration, especially of Generation Y and X. Now, if you're looking at the criteria of a mentor, I think generosity is the most important. It's time, expertise, and credit. Time is tough. No one has enough time, and you have to realize that whatever time you give to a young mentor, when you spend those two hours and night reviewing a manuscript, it's really time that you're taking away from yourself and your family. Then there is generosity of expertise, so you must be, as a surgeon, incredibly comfortable with yourself, with your knowledge, to transmit that to a mentee. That was Larry Wade did for me. And then there is generosity of credit. It's basically a radical shift that the mentor has to accept. He or she has to realize that she is, he or she is the present, the past, but the mentee is the future. So it's that transition that also made in 1890, and sometime in Italy never, was never made. And part of the problem is that, especially in the academic world, there is the so-called prima donna diva complex. Especially the baby boomer feel that the moment they retire, the world of surgery was, will fall apart. So that's the tough one. Now, I read uh, uh, years ago a book about the train of life. It's interesting. You, when you are born, basically, you get into a train, you meet your parents, your siblings, and then there will be friends and other people that will come on board during your journey. Unfortunately, your parents uh, will uh, leave at another station and you'll be on your own. But in a way, this can represent also your career. You start your career and there are people that get on the train and they're incredibly meaningful for you. So I would like to acknowledge some of them. One is Carlos Pellegrini. I met him in, on June 23rd, 1983 for his birthday, so it's been a while. And, uh, uh, 
has been a great mentor over the years. Uh, another one is Lawrence Way, which I mentioned before. And then there is uh, John Wong. Here he is uh, in the day of his fish rift, uh, when he retired in China. And then there are people that I met during my journey. I've been in three different institutions. This is the University of California, San Francisco. I, instead of one year, I spent 25 years there. So you see at the very top, Ali Debas was the chairman, gave my job, and then uh, endocrine surgeon. They will be a recurrent team, Orlo Clark and Kwan Yandu, and other people you recognize. But then I want to acknowledge it to other people. One was a chief resident with me, Jerry Doherty. It was very easy to predict that he was going to have a brilliant future, and today he's the chair of surgery at the Brigham Hospital in Harvard. But another one was a medical student. She was a riot. She was knowledgeable. She was fun. That's Jennifer Sang, and today she's chair of surgery at Boston University. In 2008, I moved to the University of Chicago, recurrent team, endocrine surgeons at Kaplan and Peter Angelos, and then, on the right, Alessandro Fichera, a colorectal surgeon. I'm very happy to say that uh, he will join us in Chapel Hill in November. And then, North Carolina, pay attention. It's not the, not the University of North Carolina. So we have Nick Shane, famous gastroenterology, uh, Bruce Kearns. He leads one of the uh, most famous burn units in the United States, Anthony Charles. And then two other people that actually I met along the way, seven miles from UNC where I work, there is a small place called Duke University, uh, Sanziana Roman and Julian Sosa. And uh, I would like to formally introduce Julian Sosa as the new editor of the World Journal of Surgery of the International Society of Surgery. But then there are... <laughs> Julian, please thank <laughs> And then there are, of course, other people. So my brothers played a role incredibly successful in what they've done. Now, it's interesting because you might look at the picture superficially and say, gee, you guys look alike. But if you look at the body language going from right to left, it's completely different. And then, as you expect in many uh, presidential talks, I want to recognize my wife, Melina Kibi. Wonderful human being, uh, wonderful uh, uh, companion in life. But I can tell you much more than that. When I was during my last few years at the University of Chicago, in part because of the economic crisis, all the focus in the United States was on productivity, was on money. So they lost completely the ideal, the inspiration, the academic mission. So I was really a little bit uh, uh, turned off by all of that. Thanks to Melina, uh, I regained that enthusiasm in academic life. She's not only my wife, she's a vascular surgeon, but also she's the chair of the Department of Surgery at UNC where I work. My psychiatrist told me it was not good to be in the same department, so as Ken mentioned, I'm in internal medicine. But I operate once in a while. So thank you very much. I started on one side of the tunnel, and now that I'm getting older, I realize that uh, I've been walking along the tunnel, and no, now I'm at the end. And when you are along your career, and uh, more or less uh, retirement is not so far away, it's nice, you think for a moment, what have I done in uh, my career? So I know that is a big word, but in a way, you think about your legacy. What will people remember of what I've done? Now, for a few years, I really thought that this is what was important, the academic position, what you wrote, uh, membership, leadership. Believe me, these things are important, are part of your mission, are incredible satisfaction. I mean, to stand here today for me is absolutely unique. I will remember for the rest of my life. But this is not why or how people will remember you, because at the end of the day, you will just be another person and did what other people have done, went through a department, and then I retired. So I'm particularly proud of two things. 
And both have something in common. That are the things that you do for yourself are gone when you're gone, but what you do for other people is really your legacy. The first one, like many of you, is what I've done for my patients. Early in my career, I decided to focus on esophageal surgery. I like to know a lot about very little. Maybe like Professor Hunter, I do five, six operations, but we try to do them well. I don't think I cure many people with cancer, but sure enough, there are more people that can swallow without problems. And I was lucky because I really love my job. Uh, it's what gets you up every morning and you are enthusiastic about doing what you're doing. And again, if you choose a job that you love, it feels like you will never have to work in your life. But what makes me particularly proud, as Ken Boffer was mentioning, is really the mentorship. Uh, so I had hundreds of clinical fellows, but uh, a special part in my heart is for the research fellows. These are young people that came from all over the world to do research. So they publish, it was a clinical, not a clinical experience for them, it was really to be exposed to a different system. In red are all the fellows from Italy. I felt that I was lucky and I had to give something back. The last one in this slide is sitting right here, is Francisco Schlottmann from Buenos Aires. And I'm very proud that some of them are here today. As Ken Boffer was mentioned, some went back to their own country, some stayed in the United States, and they are very successful today. And I hope that even if minimal, I contribute to their love for the profession and their success. So what I'm trying to leave you with is the concept of the circle of academic life. When I was in AUCSF for those long 25 years, I was a mentee. When I moved to Chicago, there was a transition to become a mentor. But as you can see, there is not the full circle. The full circle, I think, when you become really effective as a mentor, is when you recognize the value of what the mentee are bringing to you. They keep you honest. They push you to read. They push you to be productive. So it's when you become a mentor-mentee that you really complete the circle of life. And as an example, here I am in 1983, standing left to Professor John Wong, a long time ago. And then, uh, 22 years later, left to me, there is a young resident, interesting, Ian Wong, from the University of Hong Kong that came to spend some time with me at the University of Chicago. So that is the circle of life. I'm almost at the end of my talk, and I would like to leave you with a message for members of my generation baby boom generation, and for the young people that are present in the room. For the members of my generation, never regret getting old. Too many people never had that privilege. And uh, if you want to read a book that will make you feel good about the fact that you are 60, 70, or 80, read this book, When Breath Becomes Air, written by Paul Kalaniti. It's a beautiful book. Paul uh, was a brilliant individual was a resident in neurosurgery at Stanford, and uh, two years from completing his uh, training, when he was 35, he was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. He had never smoked a day in his life. So during the last two years, while undergoing chemotherapy, he was able to finish, to get married, to have a child, and he wrote this beautiful book. So for the baby boomers, this is my message. As baby boomers, we must acknowledge the characteristic of each generation accepting them for what they are, treasuring the contribution that they can give. We need to accept them as a form of evolution, not as a different and wrong way to be a surgeon. This is all I can say for the baby boomers. Now, for the generation X and Y, I don't think anything can be said better than what Steve Jobs said when he gave the commencement speech to the 2005 graduating class in college at Stanford University. He said, and I quote, your time is limited. Don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people thinking. Don't let the noise of other opinion drown out your inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. So for the young generation, this is my advice. Keep an eye on the destination 
but more than anything else, enjoy this wonderful journey. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and I wish you a wonderful, friendly and productive Congress. Thank you very much. <laughs>